Okay, so now I would love to welcome up to the table um, our keynote speaker, Dr. Rajiv Jangiani, who is the new Vice Provost for Teaching and Learning at Brock University. Um, actually, we are lucky to have Rajiv here on his first day at uh, his new job. So <laughs> thanks for choosing us. Um, and I'm also really honored to welcome up Dr. Camille Gentle Stiert, um, who is a colleague of mine both at Roger Williams University and she's also a fellow for NEBI, um, doing great work with the Reparative Justice Program. So get, get comfy and get settled. This is going to be such a treat, but honestly, I'm still recovering from just digesting the magnificence of that student panel. It's always a highlight of every event, but but truly, that was extraordinarily eloquent and thoughtful um, and, and uh, vulnerable. Appreciate it. Thank you all. Yes, thank you so much. This is um, I have a lot of notes and that will certainly inform some of the things that I'm going to say. So thank you for that leading. <laughs> And um, so thank you everybody for being here. I am very excited to be sharing this um, keynote conversation with Rajiv. And um, we, I, I think we've only, I, we've only known each other for a few weeks, but we have so many things in common that it's, it's ridiculous. So it's, it's been a pleasure getting to know him. Um, and so what, what we want to do with this is to start with us having a conversation. So I'll have a few questions to pose to Rajiv. Um, he will ask questions back. Um, I'll share some thoughts of my own, and then I'm hopeful that we'll have some time where you can ask questions um, of us as well. So the I would say that the purpose, if, if we're going to identify any purpose of this session, it would be to certainly highlight open education resources, but then open education practices generally, and also to push it, right? Like to push where we think that open education practices can actually go. Uh, so we're going to start by just sharing some brief thoughts based on um, what's been percolating in our minds, and then we'll get into some questions. Rajiv, would you like to start? Sure, and, and I'll reciprocate, I have to say. So we met in person yesterday for the first time in the afternoon, and I wish we had recorded that, honestly, because uh, we were just absolutely pinging off each other in terms of our lived experiences. Yeah. And I think what, share, what we share and what unites us is the values that we bring to this work and that inform our work, certainly. So thank you to, to Lindsay, who I can't see Lindsay right now. She's omnipresent, wherever she is. Um, <laughs> but Lindsay is a force of nature, as many of you know, and, and many of us in the room would do anything for Lindsay. And so uh, it's a treat to, to be here again with all of you and especially to work with uh, old colleagues and collaborators like Robin and Nicole and now Camille. Mm -hmm. But yeah, some context. Uh, um, for those of you who don't know, uh, I, I, until yesterday, uh, I, I was working at Kwantlen Polytechnic University in British Columbia um, for 15 years, where we built a very robust open education program. Um, and today is my first day at my new job at uh, Brock University. And of course, I'm spending it doing exactly what I love doing. Um, <laughs> But but more to the point, I mean, we often introduce ourselves in terms of, you know, our academic roles and what we do, but maybe more into, more importantly, what informs this work, what drives this work, and this is where our conversation began yesterday. So I grew up in, in India, in a small town of 25 million people called Bombay. Uh, it's a lovely place, but very different world, of course. Uh, and when, when I came to North America as an international student, I was one of those international students who struggled with food insecurity, who really, really understood how difficult it was adding to the uh, adding the currency conversion to the problem. Later on in my career as a contingent faculty member, I remember well uh, trying to put together jobs at three or four different institutions, often driving between them on the same day to try and cobble together a job. And so when we're having these conversations about precarity among students, I don't want to ignore the precarity among the the professoriate as well. Uh, and so we're often calling upon those who are the precariat mm. to address, um, uh, in fact, the problems of the precarious. Mm -hmm. So I think it's these wider systemic issues that for me inform, I think, what is the gulf between the promise and the potential of higher education to serve mm -hmm. as a force for economic and social mobility to unlock human potential, but what it is in reality, which very often ends up replicating and reinforcing existing power hierarchies. And so I think for, for us, this is this is the work. This is the key work. Open is critically important. We've worked on this for the last decade. 
I haven't worked on this as long as Nicole has, but certainly over the last decade, been working on authoring open textbooks as a faculty author, adopting them, doing research on the efficacy, perceptions, advocating around the world. A um, lot of work with Robin and others on open pedagogy, of course, and, and more recently in the last five years, building institutional uh, structures and supports to try and advance this work. But, but for me, open will always be a means, yeah. right? And the end over here is what, uh, in fact, uh, was raised helpfully during the student panel, particularly in the distinctions between the types of justices. Mm -hmm. That were one of my notes that I was going to bring up. So thank mm -hmm. you for, 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 for flagging that. But it is uh, about justice, uh, because one of the things I think we hope to talk about is how it's easy to do. I mean, it's not happening everywhere, it's, but it's fairly easy to actually have positive immediate gains uh, in outcomes, educational, economic and other outcomes by simply working with OER. But it is also possible to do this work fairly uncritically and to do harm with the very best of intentions. If you assume, for example, that the digital is the solution, you forget about digital redlining. If you think mm -hmm. about access and you forget about accessibility, mm -hmm. if you, you know, don't think about traditional academic gatekeeping and who gets to author OER mm -hmm. and the diversity of mm -hmm. ideologies represented in the text that are available. And so for, for, for us, I think we're hoping to move this to a more critical conversation where we can do good, but make sure we're not doing harm with the best of intentions. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Yeah, thank you, Rajiv. And so I'll also share a, a bit about, you know, what brings me to this work. Uh, I am also an immigrant. I was born and raised in Jamaica. Um, and uh, there's there's a lot I could say about the Jamaican um, education system. That's for another conference. Uh, for now, um, I can talk about, I, I came to the United States um, just in time to go to college. I did my undergrad at CUNY at Lehman College, so LaGuardia. Uh, and, um, and then I, I did my, my uh, doctorate at University of Michigan. And I remember starting, so a couple of things stay in my mind from my undergraduate that, um, so when people tell me that educational violence is not something that's mm -hmm. real, and I can point to my um, experiences. So two, there are several of them, but two things stand out in my mind is that um, you have to do those entrance exams, you know, like those tests for mm -hmm. placement in English and so forth. I was placed in a remedial English class because even though my native language, not native, actually, no, my colonial <laughs> official language, I speak, I speak English fluently, but um, I didn't know where to put the commas. <laughs> and so I was placed in a remedial class because of that and my English professor at the time couldn't figure out why I was there. Um, secondly, was that for the first two years of my undergraduate career, I had a counselor who advised me to take 12 credits instead of the 15 credits because she didn't think I could do it. And it wasn't until, again, the end of my sophomore year that a family member said, if you keep taking those credits at, like that, you will not graduate. And so I had to decide on my own to I mean, with support from community to um, take the credits that I needed to so that I wasn't um, behind. And so those two things have um, pretty much marked my experience or they stand out the most as a mother now. So I'm raising a 12 year old brilliant girl, but, you know, 12. <laughs> <laughs> We, we can have another conversation about 12, but um, I realize now that parenting her as she, she's not in higher ed, but I have to tell her there are things that she's reading and talking about in her school, and I have to come and sort of do some kind of cleaning up work around what she's seeing and what she's hearing and what she's reading and I have to do some extra work around making sure that I'm exposing her to things that are going to be validating to her identity and her self sense of self and so all of those things my really my embodied experiences as an immigrant black woman from the third world so-called third world raising a little black girl in the United States makes this an imperative for me um, to participate in. And so Rajiv, what I thank you for sharing your um, what brings you here. And so could you I wanted us to talk a bit about like what are you mentioned wanting to push um, uh, put a critical spin or, or, or couch open education in this critical lens. Can you talk a little bit more about that? 
Yeah, absolutely. And, and it's funny, again, this, ha- this kept happening yesterday when we were talking about our backgrounds. Oh, I share this too. I share this too. <laughs> Same thing happened, right? If somebody had, t- had taken five minutes to have a conversation with me when I moved to Canada, yeah. they would have realized I don't need to take an English diagnostic test, yes. for example. So so when we assume, when we look at these outcomes, right, disproportionate outcomes for students from underrepresented uh, minorities or, or marginalized backgrounds in various sorts, right, it's not an accident, right, mm-hmm. this, that these outcomes are as they are. The system, like this is a feature of the system. It's not a bug. It's designed to replicate the system. Mm. Um, But yeah, in terms of critical conversations, this has been a really, really wonderful thing. I think from my perspective and many of our perspectives, working in the open education movement, I've seen a real change. Uh, Camille asked me about this yesterday. Um, You know, 10 years ago, there was really, really important groundbreaking work happening. 20 years ago, in fact, MIT OpenCourseWare launching, Creative Commons creating their licenses and those proliferating around the world. Lots happening that's good. Cape Town declarations, lots lots of momentum. But the voices that were leading the open education movement, to be quite frank, were the voices of those who enjoyed a fair degree of privilege. And one of the things I've seen over the last decade is voices that do not represent that background uh, being given a being given a position or earning that position or fighting for that position to be able to share those experiences. And so the, the simplistic message, which is very easy if you're doing this elevator pitch, right, we often would do something like, well, here's what we are, here's how they can benefit, here's the impact, and it does have an impact. But one of the reasons I love OER is, is just as marginalized students disproportionately suffer at the hands of commercial textbook publishers, as I did, they disproportionately benefit because those benefit accrue. Oh, oh, oh. So the critical conversations, I think, have been a reflection of the conversation and who's leading those conversations. Um, there's a wonderful volume that Robin and I and many others worked on, 43 authors worked on recently, called Open at the Margins. And Lindsay, I'm looking for Lindsay. Through Lindsay, we will circulate that volume among many other resources with everybody attending or following this online. But that is a collection of critical conversations or perspectives around open Mm -hmm. education. And it was around these kinds of things. So back in the day, I remember there was an early open textbook in astronomy. This is just an example where... Uh, you know, people were trying to hit the highest enrolled courses to affect the, the or to benefit the, the maximum number of students. It's a strategy that made a lot of sense to governments in particular. Universities often took the complementary approach where they were upper level niche courses that didn't have textbooks might be a um, serve as an ambassador or reflection for that program for the institution. So you saw niche courses and, up and lower level courses, kind of different approaches. But with the astronomy book, the assumption was, all right, we fixed that problem. Let's move to the next uh, next mm-hmm. subject area. But, you know, colleagues in South Africa noting that, you know, the sky looks a little bit different from the Southern Hemisphere, that book may not you know, work. And then we talk about the epistemologies more deeply that, that, that embed the text. And so for me, it's been a really helpful thing. I'll point to the work of people like Chris Gilliard, for example, who's done extraordinary work on digital redlining. Um, people like, uh, you know, Jess Mitchell and others who've worked on, uh, Tara Robertson, who've worked on accessibility, uh, groups like BC Campus, who've ensured that uh, there are guides to ensure that accessibility is an integral part of, of when we talk about access and creating open textbooks platforms, for example. Mm-hmm. And that's just the skimming the surface. You know, um, Cheryl Hodgkinson Williams um, from South Africa, Sarah Lambert from uh, Australia, mm-hmm. examples of scholars who've done really critical work uh, at the intersection of justice and open education. And, and so I think it's not an accident. You know, Jasmine Roberts Cruz is another one. It's not an accident that the voices that have been more critical have been reflecting the lived experiences of mm. those who we are trying to benefit. And so as the, as the open education community has uh, become more or are less male dominant mm. and certainly a little less uh, uh, you know, Caucasian dominant, we've seen the conversation get critical, which is helpful because again, uh, as, as uh, I think Bob started with this recollection of the disability rights movement, which is indeed nothing about us without us, mm. um, that is part of it. So for me, that's the exciting part of this is it's easy to do good, but it's easy to, to mm-hmm. also make, you know, have accidental harm. And so the critical conversation is, is ensuring that, that we do this in the right way. Uh, and that we are we are creating support structures where it's not just again going to do good in a way that's that you know the way both of us have been co-opted in the past mm-hmm. with here's your university diversity in the faculty or administration you know the dark side is not that dark folks um <laughs> you know so it, it's it's fascinating to see it change um and for me that's the most exciting part of it is the new voices that are emerging uh, and to be able to try to create a movement that really reflects the needs of those who are most trying to benefit over here. Right. 
Agreed. And so um, that flows nicely into my thoughts around uh, how to take up like a critical perspective as we're doing um, open education, meaning how do you ground it in social justice? Mm. And so one of the thoughts that I had um, was around one adding another R. So we heard about Nicole presented a few R's that were very useful in terms of thinking about what open means. Um, and um, was it Yerga, I believe, presented a few more R's, redistributive justice, etc. I want to add reparative justice. Mm. I do think that um, open education, open educational practices and resources that come out of that should be reparative in the sense that they are um, invested in repairing the harm that has been done to marginalized, um, underserved people, overall students and faculty and staff within the um, institution. And so to be reparative means that one, you're going to have to sit with and acknowledge and talk about the harm. We can't just get to step two without acknowledging that something happened and something is happening. So it means acknowledging that and it means repairing, suturing, and it means being invested in the continuous healing. It's not a one time kind of thing where, all right, we have addressed, we've addressed this. We've had the fireside chats. We're done. We've sent out the statements. We have, we're done. It's a healing, if you think about even healing of our bodies, it's a process, right? Like you go do an operation, you get, you know, cut and sutured up, but the, 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 the healing part is what takes a lot more time and investment. So um, I would say be very intentional about reparative, particularly focusing on healing. So asking questions like, how does open education um, contribute to the repair and healing of communities that have been harmed by this very system that you want them to come into. How can that be? How can, if I would say we start there. Like, how are we moving? Um, and that leads me to like another point that then, if we're going to be creating open educational resources and engaging in open education practices, then um, I would say connect it to some critical mm. inquiry that is connected to these movements that are about exposing and redressing um, social inequalities, right? So uh, I, I'm glad that Nicole brought up the Open for Anti-Racism um, program because I thought that here you saw a pairing of training in open educational resources, but also it being very connected to a purpose to repair. Right, like connecting it to um, social justice causes in very real ways. So connecting your open educational resources or your open education practice, grounding them in black feminist thought, grounding them in disability studies, grounding them in gender and sexuality studies, meaning grounding them in these places that have a history of challenging the status quo. And then I think then that will help us to get to what the student panel was saying in terms of using this to challenge um, the, the existing, and I believe somebody else also said about exist, uh, challenging the existing status quo. Um, and then, yeah, I wanna just kind of put a little insert there for, for our faculty as well, that um, yes, I do believe that as a faculty, many, I do believe that many of my colleagues are, um, uh, may not want to do it, let's just leave it at that. Uh, but I also want to put in there the, 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 the voices of marginalized faculty who may want to do it, but it, it is, it, sometimes it's not feasible. I was having a conversation at a table at the reception with some um, uh, colleagues who are here who spoke about how it takes time to do this. And if you are an adjunct, or if you are at a 4-4, a teaching institution 4-4, where, where? does the time come from, especially if there's no institutional support for that? How do you do it? Um, how do you do it also, to be quite honest, can I be honest, Reggie? This is what we're here for. I mean, the OE world yeah. is still very white. And that is that can be repelling to faculty of color who may be doing this, they may have, they may be taking up the critical ideas and the philosophies behind open education. But when you look and the leadership, for example, of OE movements are white, then it comes off as, um, as a practice or a movement that may not be interested in racial justice. 
that may not be interested in um, repairing the, that kind of racial yeah. harm. Yeah. Um, and so if, if we're talking about being, you know, social justice, <clears throat> led and seeped in social justice, then that has to be a part of what's what's happening in the movement as well. You know, like who are the leaders? Scribbling over your way over here. I, I completely agree. I mean, I think it's it's interesting also because on the one hand, I think there's been more and more people making very direct connections between the work. Uh, you talk about black feminist uh, yeah. thought, for example, you know, Audre Lorde, Bell Hooks, Toni Morrison. There's a lot of connections over there. And, 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 and for quite a while I mean I, there were exceptions to be sure but I think there's this sort of almost almost a sense of oh you know we've discovered this new thing without really the intellectual honesty of reaching back to what is the philosophy and political tradition this connects to and so when we're talking about partly dismantling the master's house over here with what tools and so when you are using those tools of course it is true as a as a as a marginalized faculty member for example there's less tolerance for failure yes. right you're tap dancing on an electrified fence to some degree yeah. and so you have to be very careful about when you choose to experiment uh, yeah. even as a as a whether you're a tenured faculty member as well you're up for or you're up for tenure and promotion let's say you know when you experiment when you deviate from what the normative practice is pedagogical practice teaching and learning assessment practices when you deviate from the norm you have to be very careful about that particularly when you know and i'll say this as a psychologist and a scholarship of teaching and learning researcher, you know, there is that 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 difference and newness. And sometimes student evaluations respond yes. to difference and newness that is not necessarily in the best interest of student learning either. But it's just a challenge. It's a change and it's a threat. And it's you're asking me to do what? If you want to democratize education, co-construct knowledge, that's really exciting and invigorating. And they often remember those experiences. They, they are absolutely formative experiences uh, but they come at a risk of negative student evaluations because you're asking me to do more work yes. um you know can you not do what every other professor is doing which is indeed asking me to buy a 400 dollars textbook with an access code so yes i have to pay to do my homework but it's all set up you're not asking me to engage in constructivist learning for example right so so there is this sort of really interesting tension and, and you think about uh, you know, in these positions, when you're going to expend your political capital, when you're going to advance, when you're going to challenge the status quo. And so this is one of the reasons why I will always distinguish between the behavior of faculty members and their values and interests, right? Because you will sometimes see faculty members making choices that on the surface look like it's not again, not in the interest of students, not as much as OER, for example, mm. but it's coming from a good place or it's coming because they're trying to navigate really complex political environments. Mm -hmm. And so this is for me exactly it is we can have it so that highly privileged faculty authors are creating OER. We can have it so that uh, tenured faculty, those who have a lot more, as a psychologist, we would say idiosyncrasy credits. Mm -hmm. So basically the ability to deviate from the norm uh, without mm -hmm. serious repercussions um, uh, can, can engage in open pedagogy, for example. But they're still going to be swimming against the current. And, and if the current is going to be too strong for the faculty who we really want to be able to participate in this, to make this work equitable mm -hmm. and truly inclusive. And so that's the challenge is, as administrators, one of the things I'd love to talk about with all of you and hear your questions about also is, what are these things that we can do to, to change that current? Because mm -hmm. there are some really, really big things, some not very difficult that can change the current. Because otherwise, again, on the surface, we will have enough examples that we can parade around and make ourselves feel wonderful and watch those student dollar savings tick up. But we need to approach this with a more critical eye if we really, really want to embrace this in a way that reflects the values that we're trying to uphold. Yeah, agreed, Rajiv. And a, a part of, and that's a good segue into another question that I wanted us to um, to address and, and put to the audience to think about is, um, what are some of the unintended mm. and unexpected impacts of open education practices um, on faculty, on students, uh, particularly when it's not done in this kind of transformative social justice centered way? Um, and uh, and you've highlighted some of that, how how it, it you could be using you. You have if we use open educational resources without having a particular critical lens, then really what you may end up doing is creating um, free access to more of the texts that are going to cause harm. Because if it's the same people 
who are reproducing the same people who have access to create the books and to do the kind of work that's necessary, then they're, they'll bring their same ideas into that as well. So um, uh, that could be certainly one of the issues, recreating the status quo through these, um, through the open education resources. And then I was also thinking about, and somebody already brought this up. This may have been the student, student panel, I think. Student panel, yay. I think that was you. Um, but somebody also spoke about, no, it may have also been Nicole, but the, the um, equality, equity mm. kind of debate. And there have been lots of um, visual aids and lots of conversations that help to um, acknowledge the distinction between um, a, a process and a, a program that is focused on equality and one that's focused on equity. And I believe that maybe in hopes of selling, quote, selling program, selling OE um, to institutions, part of the narrative that has taken over open education is the, equi the equality model. This is going to be good for all students. All students are going to be able to thrive. And we want all students to be able to, et cetera, et cetera. Now, it doesn't sound bad, Rajiv, not at all. It sounds really good. It's, it's, it's seductive. It's very seductive. But when we live in a society that is deeply, historically and contemporarily hierarchical, then when you give everybody the same thing, you just end up with the same hierarchy. <laughs> you end up with the same hierarchy. So not using so being I, I do think not intentional, but um, open educational movement should push more for an equity model, as in what is it that students need? What is it, particularly if you have um, equity based on reparative justice? What do students who have been the most underestimated need? What do students who have been the most underserved need? And you know what's funny, but not funny, Rajiv? That if it's it's funny because the equity model, the equality model, rather, have been used to say, well, if we get everybody, and if we generalize to everybody, then somehow everybody will get it. It will trickle down somehow, and everybody. That has not happened. What will happen, though, quite really, I think, I don't have the research. I, it's, it's anecdotal, not data, right? I'm just saying. But I will. I am confident that if we aim for the least, the people who have been made the least among us, that that means that we're going to catch everybody. We catch everybody when we aim for the least, the people who have been made the least. So this idea that, well, we need to do this kind of equality thing because it's the quote American way, it's actually been, the, even though it's really good and idealistic, it's really been a weapon and a tool to reinforce the hierarchies that exist. And I don't think that, I really think that um, open education movements need to, to move away from that kind of, of discourse mm. of equality. Mm. You know, it's interesting. I, I mean, maybe it's partly also just coming from the Canadian context, but the American dream is not something I'm accustomed to, to listening about, about. Um, the, the American daydream, maybe, but um, the, but, you know, I think even in Canada, the conversation has shifted quite a bit. Certainly society in Canada is, you know, deeply grappling with at different levels, questions around reconciliation and indigenization and what this means for a Canadian identity as well. So it's not like Canada's some sanitized utopian north, even though socialism is not a bad word north of the border. Um, but, you know, I, there's been language shifts over there as well. And in British Columbia, where I live and work on the unceded traditional um, lands of the Coast Salish peoples, mm -hmm. the ministry used to issue these letters that described the importance of work in equity, which is what we talk about all the time. But in terms of we need to benefit equity seeking groups and think about where the onus is placed with mm -hmm. that term. Mm -hmm. So you mm -hmm. need to seek it, you know, um, and then it shifted a couple of years ago to equity deserving groups uh, as though that's like, you know, slightly better. It's like, okay, I'll throw you a crumb. You actually, it's not just you're randomly looking for something. You, you do have some, some claim to this. And now it's shifted further to equity de denied groups, mm -hmm. which is, it's getting warmer. It's a little warmer, mm -hmm. you know, so, and it's interesting to see that. So I think, 
you know, obviously that's an evolving conversation, but, you know, I would say even empirically, the research that I've seen and, and, and Nicole helpfully cited the work of Edward Watson, Nicholas Colvert, the people at Georgia, uh, in Georgia who studied, that was a very large study as well, which I love, over 20,000 students that showed the disproportionate benefit accruing to students oh. um, who were marginalized uh, Pell recipient students, part-time students and the like. And so we have seen that, which is really nice. And so I would say I have seen much more of a focus on, on equity in that language, in the advocacy. Um, but of course, the, the, the challenge, as, as uh, to use Bob's expression, is indeed where the rubber hits the road. And so you know, to, 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 to advance strategies that, practi that practically influence equity instead of influencing uh, or trying to use equity, but actually addressing things with an equality approach mm -hmm. uh, is, I, I think, key. But to maybe go back to, to your question about unintended, um, unintended impacts, in, and there are some that are positive and some that are negative, I would say. Uh, but in the negative spin, I, I think one of the things I think about is curious elements of the status quo. So mm -hmm. for example, I'd love for somebody to explain this to me, how we've managed to let the private sector get away with this. Um, and because, you know, you think about ac academia as a collection of fairly intelligent people. Uh, and of course, we engage in traditional um, publishing with scholarship, where we hope fork over our copyright with giddy delight when we get an acceptance from a, from a journal without thinking about yeah. intellectual property there. But, but this happens even in terms of convenience, right? So as we sign up to, to textbooks, as we allow the textbook publishers to come say, well, we're gonna make your life even more convenient now. We're gonna have homework quizzing platforms. So A, you don't need to write the materials for your students to read. B, you don't need to create uh, quizzes or questions. We'll give you that as well. Your students will pay for that, don't worry. Um, C, you don't need to create your own lecture slides. We're gonna give you these frankly awful, ghastly, uh, you know, uh, package of, of uh, PowerPoint slides to go with your, with your text as well. We're sort of feeding in to the increasing, um, I'm going to have to use the word neoliberal, okay. neoliberalization of the academy, right, where, where we are actively facilitating and upholding the degree of the precarity that continues to be upheld um, with increased proportions of contingent faculty members as an example. So, yes, we can talk about life being slightly easier for a contingent faculty member who's hired two weeks before the semester begins if the department has already adapted created adopted on mass we are that's customized for their program here you go now that's the convenience that the commercial publishers are preying upon right that's that's the exact situation that they're there to take advantage of and so this is again what i want to make sure we're not doing something that feeds into upholding a system that continues to prey upon the people who live within it effectively. Mm -hmm. So th I think those are the pieces around convenience. Um, I mean, Krishna, you helpfully talked about the move at MIT away from textbooks, and I think this is another great example. You know, we talk about textbooks often. We also talk about open pedagogy uh, mm -hmm. because, you know, textbooks often a conversation starter. People don't know what this is. So it's a vocabulary that people understand and it's not a bad place to actually begin this work. It tangibly affects students. But yes, do we really want to continue to uphold a model of pedagogy that revolves around bending your course to map onto the table of contents of a textbook? Mm -hmm. Heck no. You know, so, so of course we want to, you need to play all sides of this over here. But this is why the advocacy is also necessarily nuanced. So we talk about OER, we'll talk about soon about open, open pedagogy and what that means. And I know in Robin and my thinking, it, it's, you know, yes, it can be about working with OER, but it doesn't have to be about working with OER at all, in fact. Right. It's, it's really about changing the model of education, moving away from what Freire described as the banking concept of education uh, and democratizing that experience. That's threatening and frightening for um, students and faculty initially, it's incredibly liberating and it's a game changer. And so, so this is the question of, you know, um, I don't know why these X, XKCD memes are playing in my head right now, <laughs> but, but very much, you know, so I, you know, can hang out with the means, but I'm much rather party with the outliers. And for me, that's a little <laughs> bit of the OER open pedagogy conversation. Absolutely. So, yeah, yeah. no, I, I, I hear you. And <clears throat> this, um, idea of changing systems and not necessarily like changing an assignment or so forth, right? Like being able to um, 
if you're going to be implementing open education resources, then not necess not just making it an add-on to a course, um, but also thinking mm -hmm. more critically and holistically about the course and how is it that you're going to um, make OER a part of your open critical pedagogy, right? Like changing your way of being in the classroom. Can 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 that be the the aim? Where open education resources are a tool, or tools rather, to that changing systems. Um, and as um, Nicole was talking and showing the numbers, um, I'm happy about the increase in recognition of open education resources and among faculty and what they are. But it occurred to me that <clears throat> at the same time that in, um, more faculty are aware of it and they may be adopting it. It's also happening concurrently with increased um, racially motivated incidents on campuses. It's happening, this awareness is happening concurrently with critical race theory being demonized and made illegal in certain places, right? And so if we're not thinking about open education on a systemic level, then what are we doing? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What are, if, if it is about, oh, I'm so, this is so terrible, this happened to my student on campus. This is horrible. But at least you can have access to this. Then it doesn't. It doesn't yeah. make um, uh, reparative and social justice sense if we're not thinking more holistically about the well-being of our students beyond mm -hmm. what they can access in terms of resources. This yeah. needs to be a part of a again critical movement. It needs to be attached to a critical movement that is committed to transforming systems. And, and this is what you shared um, yesterday, Rajiv, in our conversation. Um, you mentioned the dichotomy between um, the uh, uh, ameliorative mm. versus transformative. Ameliorative versus transformative. And that, I believe, should be um, one of the questions that we take away from us here. Am I doing this? Do I want faculty do, to do this as a kind of ameliorative process? Or how committed am I? Or is, or is this a commitment to wanting to shift the entire system? Yeah, and, and, and that language, I should say, is, is drawn directly from the work of Cheryl Hodgkinson Williams and Henry Trotter, uh, who wrote this beautiful open access published article, which is a social justice framework for OER. And they talked about, they drew on Nancy Fraser's work on social justice, and, and they talk about the um, economic, political, and cultural dimensions of injustice. And, and the distinction between ameliorative, which is, you know, a positive um, impact, but it's not quite the same as a transformative mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. approach. And so you think about uh, ameliorative is what many of us do every day in this work, right? You you adopt OER. You're having a positive impact on students' economics. Um, you adapt OER, and and this is one of the first things I did. You know, if you wanted to do a thin adaptation, I changed the names of the examples in the text, the relatables, to reflect my students' lived experiences in in the classroom in, in British Columbia. And yes, there's that slighter, greater sense of belongingness where your students are like, I actually, for the first time, I'm seeing a name that sounds like mine. Okay. And that's helpful in terms of superficial increase in sociocultural diversity in the curriculum, right? But it's not quite as transformative as, as uh, addressing the root causes of the economic inequality or to think about the academic, structural academic gatekeeping that admits certain epistemologies right. to author those texts in the first right. place. And so that's a distinction that's incredibly helpful. So I'm going to make sure that that article, which has a beautiful table with lots of examples, is very easy to follow, is a very helpful rubric it also dovetails with the work of Sarah Lambert, mm -hmm. who talked about, in fact, representational recognitive uh, and redistributive justice as well. So I think from, from, from my perspective, there's a lot of good to be done in this space. And I see most of it happening right now on the basis of redistribution of resources mm -hmm. who, to those whom by circumstance have less, which is mm -hmm. indeed um, how, it's, uh, how it's defined, uh, but more so on an economic, now a little bit more on the cultural. Uh, but when we start to think about justice more deeply, uh, yeah, moving from ameliorative to transformative and also getting into um, representational justice as well uh, is key. And yes, because otherwise we're doing good, yes, but a band-aid on a gaping open yeah. wound is, you know, only going to so far. So. Right, exactly. 
Um, and so I, I do want to make sure that we have time to um, answer questions from you. And so I'll just pose to us two more things that we can speak to, and then we can open it up to our audience. And so uh, you've already shared some things related to this question, and I believe I've also shared some things, but what would you say are, what would you highlight as some of the barriers then to advancing OER um, in a transformative mm. way, right? So we can, not an ameliorative way, yeah. but what would be some of the barriers to this kind of transformative open education movement? Um, I'm thinking, for example, um, Leslie Chan mm. wrote about infrastructures and, um, and I think it was Kayana. Kayana, is that your name? Kiana. Kiana mentioned, hey, is it possible for us to have chairs in a circle? To, right? I would love that. But guess what? Sometimes you go into a classroom and things are buttoned down to the ground. Tables are square and can't exactly be put into a circle. Chairs can't move as, as well as you want them to move. And so even if you want to be innovative, mm -hmm. and which is one of the hallmarks of practicing open education, open education practices, um, you can't necessarily do it because you are hindered by the physical infrastructure of your classroom. Um, so that would be one thing, um, ad administ administrators, in terms of who makes decisions <laughs> around classroom furniture and classroom assignments and um, uh, design of buildings and new buildings, right? Like if you are, go if you are serious, about open educational practices and promoting them on campus. If you're serious about open pedagogy, which we're hoping that you will ground this in, then that needs to filter through all the decisions that you're making around the institution, including what kind of spaces do you want your faculty to teach in? So that, that's what came to mind when I thought about mm -hmm. that. What, what, are, what are your thoughts about some things that could really hinder this kind of transformative work? I think for me, it all sort of clusters around the question of the status quo. Because I think about that, the current again, and, and awareness of OER continues to be an issue, of course, but why, right? It's because it's not the default option yet, right? And, and of course, we need to think about this in terms of academic freedom. But, you know, awareness of OER, support tangibly in-house. I would say most institutions now, this is not like 10 years ago, people are aware you have experts in-house, you have at least a couple of librarians, maybe people in your centers for teaching and learning as well. But are they doing this work off the side of their desk? Are they doing mm. this as part of their official job? Do mm. you have dedicated roles to do this? Mm. The things that have unlocked things dramatically in the context where I've seen things transform is dedicated people, dedicated time. Mm -hmm. There have been major game changes along the way, and this requires political will. So I describe this as a bit of choreography between grassroots interest and and in, uh, and momentum and grass top support. You know, but in terms of but in terms of administrative support, you need to provide the support and get the heck out of the way. Right? It needs to be owned by the grassroots, but it has to be supported truly. So yes, implementing ZTC mark, marking and, and you know ZTC whatever uh, marking in, is, is an absolute game changer a for students for discoverability, but for institutional research because when I need to have these conversations with my board of governors finance committee uh, and I'm advocating for resources for another full time open ed position, mm. I can tell them every semester, every faculty, here's the gain in course enrollment, here's the gain in withdrawal rates, here's the gain in completion, here's the gain in course performance. Here's how this translates to tuition revenue on a, on a, on a, on a semesterly basis. I want 20% of those savings every year to sustain this work. Mm. You need to be able to have that ridiculous conversation in order to do the work that you need to do. But debt, you know, putting your money where your mouth is, mm. institutions need to support this work. That is a critical element. And I don't just mean in terms of money, I mean in terms of policies, procedures, practices. Mm -hmm. You can look at your IP policy. Is it that faculty own their IP? Is it that they're in a position to, to allocate an, or, an, or a CC license to their work if they choose to do so? Your curricular policies, mm -hmm. right? I, I, you know, your, your library policies, your textbook ordering policies. So thinking about this recognition, um, you need to sort of demystify it, but also make it so that, you know, it's not just the people who have that, again, that, that, that social and political capital, that cachet to, to be able to, to experiment with this work. Mm -hmm. uh, you need to, to change the direction of the current so that everybody who wants to can do it while respecting academic freedom. 
but the ethics as you talked about the classroom is one example you can talk about digital infrastructure as well right uh, are we forcing people to work within a learning management system exclusively is this really how knowledge works discrete mm. compartmentalized at the end of every semester the one thing we scrub from our course shells as audrey waters uh, has <laughs> noted is all trace of student activity right. what message are we sending in terms of student um, intellectual labor being yes worthless effectively yeah. you know so are we allowing people to to engage in the kind of teaching and learning environment that we are pretending to to value in mm. in, in terms of you know institutional vision uh, vision and and mission statements yeah. are often like buzzword bingo quite frankly so you need to sort of look through <laughs> and draw those direct connections between when you see words like access student success yes. make those very clear connections but you can talk about it in terms of innovation pilots. You can talk about it in terms of, you know, building, breaking down silos and working cross-functionally, but really changing the nature of the institution yeah. so that it is not the exception. It is not swimming upstream to do yeah. justice by students. Yeah. Agreed. Um, and you actually, you know, segued into the final thing, question that I had for you, um, which was about um, how, uh, what are some recommendations to mm -hmm. doing this kind of, um, to participating rather and creating a transformative, critically based open education, uh, open education movement. Um, and to, to, the, to my point about open education movements still being predominantly white, it's changing. Thank you for um, acknowledging that. But it's still being predominantly white. I would say one of my recommendations would be to involve people of color into this uh, work. And uh, but here are some caveats, though. Yes, yeah, so you, I see you nodding, nodding. But here are some caveats. It needs to be meaningful. It needs to be voluntary, and it needs to be equitable. Meaningful meaning that well, let's start with voluntary. Voluntary, just because not all people of color really want to do this kind of work. We're dealing with a lot. We're just dealing, just getting from your car to <laughs> the supermarket. To home, that's a lot. So not all of us automatically want to take up this work. Mm -hmm. Some of us do. Tap those people. It should be voluntary. It should be meaningful in that <clears throat> getting people into the room is not enough. Inclusion is not enough. Access is not enough. Um, I believe um, Michael Thomas said that this morning. Access and being in the room is not enough. It's mm -hmm. about when, the, when people of color come into the room, making sure that their voices are validated, making sure that their ideas are heard and seen and listened to and supported, right? Like giving them resources when, when necessary so that they can do the work. Um, and equitable, right? Like that involvement needs to be equitable again in, in, in the sense that um, we know that a, a part of the, 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 the wealth distribution within the academy that is also based around very you know racist ideas about who deserves to get paid and how much that person should get paid for their labor make sure that people are compensated for their labor mm -hmm. make sure that people of color are they're not just doing it because oh well this is important to you and your community and so you have a heart for it yeah but there's mortgage and um <clears throat> many cases you know i have a 12 year old who's about to go to college and i don't know how far this oe movement is going to go in six years so we may have to buy textbooks <laughs> there's just life right and um academia has been notorious for reproducing the wealth inequality among people of color and 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 their white colleagues and so making sure that when you involve people of color that they're compensated and it could be a course release, it could be a stipend, but make whatever, you know, whatever conversation you have with that particular member. Um, so I would say to ameliorate the, um, the whiteness that seems to be pervasive within open education is to, in, is to make sure to include people of color in ways that are meaningful and voluntary mm -hmm. and equitable. Mm -hmm. um, and so with that, I think that we may, are you ready to take some some other kind of questions? Yeah, I mean, I'll just add a couple of minor things yes, to what you I said, but, but absolutely, yes. I, but I couldn't agree more. I mean, honestly, I, one of the groups, one of the, we talk about this often as well, even when you offer professional development, you offer mini grants, you offer other things, you know, are you paying adjunct faculty members to attend those PD events? Or are they volunteering on their own time to, to do that? And then you're sort of wondering why they're not engaging, for example. Right. So. Yeah, I think, you know, I, I, the only things I would say is, is yes, 
for faculty, particularly marginalized faculty, students involving students, uh, again, compensating student time. Yes. But I, I, you know, for those of you who are thinking about which option you will take, I will say this, even though there are missteps that you could take, there is a lot of good that can be done and it's not that difficult to do it. But I will say as an administrator as well, it is kind of, kind of magical when you work with faculty members, those who are not just new or they could have been in, you know, working in, in your institution for a couple of decades, maybe even pre-retirement. And even at that stage, when you see them rediscover the spark, the values mm. that got them in education in the first place, it's magic. Mm. When you see students finally feel a sense of care in the classroom, compassion in the classroom. Mm. What? You're not going to ask me for proof that my family member died because I need an extension. <laughs> That's the kind of mentality shift we're talking about. Yeah. A sense of belongingness in the classroom. Finally, it is transformative. And that's the work that I think it, it, this focuses on. Mm. And, and this is where it becomes sustainable is it is truly, truly transformative when you approach it that way, because the sustainability is about that culture change. And mm. it is slow to change this incredibly conservative, uh, uh, conservative thing we call the academy, but change is possible. And it is practically possible in indirect ways, uh, in a way that is, as I say, magical, transformative. And because of those two things, quite sustainable. So yeah, I can't wait to hear your, your mm -hmm. comments, questions, anything else. Sure. But thanks for listening. I was fully expecting Krishna's hand to go up. <laughs> Let me thank you for sharing this truly extraordinary conversation with us. I, I think it was magnificent. Um, and there's so many things that I that could resonate with. Uh, I'm Canadian also. Grew up an hour and a half from Brock. Um, active learning in the classroom, engagement in the classroom, what that means for designing classrooms. Um, I, I, I'm co-chairing a committee of about 20 faculty right now and we're writing a report which is about wellness and belonging and engagement and community and one of our recommendations to MIT not to the world but to MIT is we need a classroom advisory board that includes teachers and students that bring in pedagogy and thinking about how MIT should invest in its classrooms so plus plus 10 to some of the things you said there uh, open scholarship Rajiv mentioned how we publish papers and sign over copyright. Well, it, I'm proud to be at an institution with an open access repository. All scholarship from MIT faculty is entitled to go into that repository, no matter what the publishers say. I'm also proud to be at an institution that has canceled its contract with Elsevier. Um, um, so, so lots of things. But the thing I really wanted to resonate with was the word equity. Um, I think Camille said this very well. I won't speak about equality, but I want to contrast access and equity. Um, I can't add to what you said about equality. Um, so in our context from MIT, 20 years ago when Hal Abelson and Chuck Vest and colleagues from that era created open courseware and invented, invented Creative Commons licenses, they were focused on the word access. And I think we've done that. Um, the OCW team, Kurt and Newton was on the line. We've offered access for 20 years. So access, done from our side. Equity, no. Um, and so we've been thinking a lot about, you know, equity is a higher goal than access for us. So um, the strength and the great weakness of what we offer is that it's materials from the MIT classroom. That's our brand. That's what we know. We know how to teach MIT students. That's what we've learned how to do, and that's what we offer. But that's also its weakness. Um, and so the, the, the only way, I think, to address equity, from my point of view, is collaboration across the whole OER ecosystem. It's not something that any one institution can really do by itself. And certainly, I speak for MIT and saying we cannot do it by ourselves. And so I'll give an example, which uh, I just checked with Kurt. He's OK with me saying this. Um, we have a, a nascent beginning collaboration uh, supported by the Hewlett Foundation with Tennessee State University, which is an HBCU, um, 
So it's in the Southern Regional Higher Ed Board. We're here in a NEBI meeting. This is one of the other um, higher ed boards. Um, Tennessee State is convening a consortium of HBCUs. We'll be working with them. The Hewlett support will go to Tennessee State. We're a subcontractor to Tennessee State, um, which I love. Um, and the idea is uh, HBCU faculty will be compensated. Hewlett's involvement means there can be compensation. Um, HBCU faculty take OCW material and reshape it, remix it, all those five R's, re make it better. I don't know how to teach HBCU students. They do. Okay, I know how to teach MIT students. Um, we have a, I'm very proud of the diversity of MIT students, but it's a different population than HBCU students. So HBCU faculty make those materials better, reshape them, add a cultural context, remix them, redo them, and then share them openly again on Merlot. So Merlot is involved. And then the MIT faculty, those are better materials now. MIT faculty can suck them back into the MIT classroom, improve the equity of how we teach at MIT. So that's a collaboration, which if you think about that cycle and imagine it working over a decade, can um, um, benefit all participants and the students of all those institutions. Um, we need we need more collaborations, not less. Um, and, and so I, I wanted to sort of put to both of you um, dream of collaborations. What would you what would you if if so we've had access, equity, equality, which we're going to put aside, but collaboration in OER between different kinds of institutions, but through the 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 vehicle of OER, because the power of this remix is you make it and then someone else takes it and makes it better and then it, it cycles. Um, so how would you riff on the word collaboration to add to the words you've already highlighted? Thank you for sharing that. Um, and <clears throat> I could probably say that I believe that the uh, Lindsay anyway, as she's thinking about open education um, practices at through Nebi is actually doing this kind of collaborative work because I know that there are many members of different PACs that are here. So, um, so sh yay, shout out to that. Uh, and I would say in terms of collaborative, um, being collaborative, that is certainly necessary to be in transformative because it really doesn't, if somebody goes to MIT and they can get this kind of education and they can get this kind of, but they go to a, you know, another institution and what they are experiencing is different within, within the same academia, we are reinforcing the hierarchies. So the fact that we can still say, and I thank you for sharing that, the fact that we are still saying they are MIT students, and then there are historically students from historically black college already says that we need to collaborate so that we're talking about students get into the this is idealistic get into the place where we're talking about students and where whichever institution they decide to go to one that they are able to to, to go to that institution and two when they get there they can thrive mm -hmm. and that's why the feedback that might be yeah right Precisely. So collaborative, my, my riff, is that what you call it? My riff <laughs> is that um, collaboration is important to transformation. We can't just change part of the academy. Yeah. Oh, gosh. So I'll add a couple of things to this. And, and one, I'm really gratified to hear of the nature of this collaboration, because frankly, one of the things we've seen, this is one of the work of scholarship we've looked at is the nature of OER adoption and adaptation has been fascinating to watch. And this is another example of these unintended reinforcements of these hierarchies where in my backyard for example the university of british columbia is this sort of r1 institution really well known and they create really high quality wonderful oer fairly reticent to reuse oer that's been created at other institutions right uh, whereas i see some of the most cutting edge work in teaching and learning with open education taking place at community colleges mm -hmm. at places like montgomery college in maryland that we can that we collaborate with at my former institution all the time for example so i will say there's there's interesting sort of dynamics that that play out over there and of course 
as a pragmatist to advance these ends, I will take advantage of what I need to. But yes, uh, I would say groups like the Rebus Foundation have done a wonderful work of fostering community and collaboration, uh, particularly around if there's a resource that needs to be developed, literally taking advantage of, uh, you know, OER inclined faculty members from different institutions who may be the minority in their department, but together, often connected through a disciplinary association. So in, in my discipline, it would be the Association for Psychological Science that funded some of this work. Uh, NOBA Psychology is a really good example of a collaborative OER authored project in my discipline. Um, shout out to Angela DeBago from the Hewlett Foundation, who's been really supportive of a lot of these projects. Uh, but Robin and I would also probably want to point people to the Open Pedagogy Notebook as another place where um, we've tried to create a space for community where people are experimenting with open pedagogical practices that go well beyond OER um, and share those and draw on ideas, build on them, share them back in experiment uh, to kind of normalize that. Um, in my own experience, you know, OER is very much a gift that keeps giving and it becomes more dear each time it's re-gifted. In the textbooks I've worked on have been adapted in other contexts. There's a New Zealand edition, there's a you know NYU edition. It's, it's fascinating to see what happens. And it's because of this community that springs up around it. And so I would say that's one of the most powerful things. It's certainly at the center of what BC campus tries to do. Uh, they intentionally foster community and collaboration a lot. So I think you're spot on. I know that there's another question, but I also wanted to say really quickly that even within the process of collaboration, that there also needs to be equity. So sometimes you need to know when to fall back, when to put somebody else forward. I know um, one example that comes to mind is the pulling together. I spoke about this yesterday, pulling together program in Canada where they are putting their indigenous people who are putting together um, a guide to teaching about indigenous histories for non-indigenous faculty um, at, in, in that region. And the process though is collaborative and there are many of them on it, in it, but from the, from the very beginning, they established that one, this was going to be an indigenous led process and two, that indigenous people were going to control the content. Right, and so collaborate that we can't have an equality model in collaboration either if we're going to be doing if we're going to be transformative, it needs to be equitable. We're going to do, I think, at least one more question from Marcel. I know our okay, okay, can you make it? Okay. I'd also like to remind us that we must also always be mindful of our own biases. Because we work in the open space does not mean we do not have biases when it comes to education. And so we would all like to get to the happy place, the magical kingdom where all students, a student is just a student. That student can learn at MIT. That student can also learn at Tennessee State. That student can learn at a community college or whatever. So whenever there is an inequity notice within or disparity notice within that, group, that means we have more work to do when it comes to equitable education, because college readiness should be across the board. So when a student graduates, that student should be able to go anywhere their money would take them. And so for us to recognize, to sit here and recognize that there are, equi are, are inequities in education, be it college readiness, financial or whatever, that means we have much that much more work to do. Thank you. Excellent point, Charlotte. Thank you. And Charlotte's here um, from our Southern Regional Education Board representing our compact. Thank you again, Charlotte. Thank you uh, both for those lovely questions and comments. Um, I wanted to ask, as a student coming here from a student perspective, um, if you were talking to yourself um, when you started out your educational journey, or if you're thinking about your kids or your family, uh, children you know who are coming into college, what would you want to see as infrastructure for them to support OER from the student perspective? So this is this is a big question. So there, I would I would love to for this to be a continuing conversation instead of this just being an answer. But this is this could be a part of what I'm thinking that, um, and this is personal for me, everybody. So when you hear me talk about myself and my daughter, this work is personal. I'm not making it personal. I'm not making it about me. It is about me. <laughs> it is about me. The fact that I am in this building. Is a, is a, we were talking about this at the table. The fact that we're in this building, in this space, is a radical political act, right? Like it's, thank you. So, yes, I'm going to talk about my daughter and what would I want for her coming into any institution, any higher education institution, 
I would want her to, first of all, wherever she looks on the campus, that, that her identity, her full self is affirmed. Meaning that if she walks into the library, whose pictures are she, is she looking at? Um, if she opens her, her books, whether they are sourced um, openly or they are traditional textbook, what is she learning about herself? What has been written about people who look like her? If she is going into the administration building, who is she looking at? Are there people who look like her and people who can support her? That's what I that's that's where I would get my mommy bear. <laughs> right? And that's what I'm going to be looking for when I'm going to be touring campuses. I know some of the, the, the academic stuff, right? But when I'm touring campuses, best believe that I'm going to be up in the administration building. I'm going to be looking at who's at admissions, who is the who is the head of what and what, what, what do you have up? What kind of things do you have up around campus? What is going to support my baby? Will she be okay walking across that campus every day? Will she be okay living in that dorm? Is she going to be all right for me to leave her there for four years or two years or whatever, will she be okay? And I get emotional about that. Because this is my child. And my nieces and nephews and right, like these are these are these are my people. I love the question, honestly. And it's it's interesting because we if this was more of a conventional talk instead of a conversation, I might have shared at the start some of the context. And for me, it's all also family driven. I have two boys, they're 11 and eight at the moment. And it's been interesting because over the years, you know, my older son Kabir has followed me at many visits to different institutions. So he's been in the room and I've been talking about these things. He at the moment is inclined to be a historian, but you know, again, whether he wants to go to a university, whether he wants to go to a trade school, whether he doesn't want to seek higher ed at all, I don't know yet. Um, but in terms of change, you know, here's what I think he needs to understand. And he does understand some of this. When, when I grew up in India, I grew up in, in a place of reasonable privilege. Um, you know, we had a fairly wealthy family and staff and the things that are normal in that context that sound really odd to say I could, you know, ring a bell and somebody would bring a glass of water. It sounds bewildering today. Um, but all of that was lost, you know, uh, we lost our, our home, uh, my father passed away and moving to Canada was really about me having no other option and, and my grandparents invested in me. And it was their support of me that enabled me to move to Canada, to come as an international student to eventually become a Canadian citizen, to go into the classroom and finally find a sense of belonging from an instructor who cared enough to look out for me outside of the academics, which were not the issue. It was the sense of I'm frightened, I don't see anybody like myself, I don't know if I'm comfortable over here. And that sense of belonging for me sparked this journey. And so the connection knowing that if it were not for my grandparents support of me, I would not have moved to North America, I wouldn't be in front of you here today. It's a very strong connection for me and my family and drives me to try and rebuild the world in a way that would help me if I were going through that experience again. So when I think about, you know, what I would want at university, that's a smaller piece of the pie. There's a lot that I want that I want to see changed in society, right? The conversations that still take place in the school ground about skin color, for example, that's something uh, you know we need to work on the the questions around you know belongingness uh, you know do we still get stopped by somebody in the street who tells us to go back where we came from for example there's lots that has to change and yes i think higher ed can play a, a really critical important role particularly as an incubator for much of the leadership of of future society but higher ed is is believe me is like a tiny fraction of what I want to see change by the time Kabir goes to university. Yeah. yeah.